And we are live, YouTube tells me. We are live five minutes early. Can you hear me? Do I have sound? Do we have sound? And Pamaroon, why are you deleting messages? What's the story with that? Can someone tell me if I have sound? Don't want to answer a question until I know if I have sound. Test, 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 test. Oh, thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Gregory. I want to say that I've never been called Bubble Cheeks, but I have. So, not offended. Um, all right. We have a question already in chat from Jeff Lawler. Jeff says, with all the layoffs going on, especially in tech, if a severance agreement asks you to waive your rights in exchange for payment, why does the employer include that if the EEOC says you, oh, why does the employer include that the EEOC says you can still file a complaint? Exactly. Yabba dabba do, Gregory. Um, Jeff, the EEOC says that because... There is case law that reflects that although you can give up your right to make money off a discrimination case and to litigate it in federal court, you cannot give up your right to fight with the EEOC. And there's some logic there, like it's a fundamental right. You're being attacked on the basis of your identity. It's a constitutional right that can't be bartered away. Um, and I'm I'm really stretching the case law here, but like think of think of it as as like you you don't have the right anymore. You you can't sell your person, right? You can't sell yourself into slavery or into endangered servitude anymore in the United States. That is illegal, right? And I'm not saying it's the same thing, to be clear, but there's some some legal connection as to why you also cannot um, sell your right to complain to the EEOC about discrimination. I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> Trey Morris says, can you have charges filed on an individual who committed perjury in a previous court matter? You could ask. I mean, there may be, wherever you are, whatever jurisdiction you are, there may be civil claims for perjury. Akin to something like a civil fraud, a lawsuit for um, perjury. But more realistically, you're going to be going to the DA's office or the judge, and you're going to be asking for criminal charges for perjury. That's generally how perjury is addressed. Thank you, Viral Shedding Zombie. No clicky, kick, no clicky, click, no clickety click in the audio. Thank you for saying that. Uh, for whatever reason, the live streams don't have the clicky, clicky. The professional microphone, the professional audio card, like inbound, out, out, external audio card situation. And the new computer are all at the post office. I just have to go pick them up. I had to be in New York for the week, so I wasn't able to go pick them up. But I am really hoping to get rid of the clicky clicky on the regular videos. It has been interrupting my uh, my workflow, frankly. Pam Maroon says, 1099 miscellaneous versus 1099 NEC. What can the plaintiff request in a settlement agreement? Um, I do not give tax advice. That's going to be... You can ask you. So when you're, I guess if you're asking me what can you ask for in a settlement agreement, you can ask for anything, right? Um, doesn't mean they're going to agree to it. So often people will try to get everything on a 1099. I often need 1099 miscellaneous. Um, not saying you should or shouldn't. Not giving you tax advice. So I'm just saying I often see 1099 miscellaneous, um, and that's always the goal. Like a lot of clients want everything on a 1099. But the fact of the matter is the IRS watches for employment law settlements that all go on a 1099. They don't care for that too much because it changes their their taxes situations. Um, yeah. Uh, Gregory Ilinsky says, I worked for a major factory. My boss made up a story that I was bullying another employee. I filed many grievances with a union. I was taken out by security. I was fired but found innocent after. Uh, Gregory 
the question I have about that is, um, why you? Why were you singled out? Why was this made up about you? Like, why did they tell this story about you? Because if there's some form of discrimination motivating it, then it could be a claim. Jeff Lawler asks a follow-up question. Vince, why do severance agreements have a lot of verbiage in them, like not filing discrimination complaints with the EOC, if the EEOC says you can't waive those rights? Jeff, I don't have your agreement in front of me, but generally what agreements have is that you can file with the EOC. You just can't profit from filing with the EOC, and you can't go on to litigate your case. Um, that's generally what I see in most boilerplate severance packages and settlement agreements. Uh, settlement agreements where an EOC charge has not already been filed. Uh, Mr. D says, had a question. I'm dealing with my ex-employer's corporate attorney about settling a state agency discrimination case, and the attorney is blowing me off constantly. Any suggestions? Get your demand out there, and then litigate. Push forward. Right, you need to apply leverage. That's that's the big thing. If the attorney's blowing you off, you need to apply leverage. Um, probably the best thing you can do to, to make that attorney be responsive and answer your questions. Uh, before I answer Tiffany's question, let me introduce my co-star for today. Of course, we have the uh, Fred Flintstone outfit on and a nice Talisker 18. I am reprehensible enough to put ice in a Talisker 18, um, but I got I got two hours of live question and answer. I can't. I need a little water in, in the in the scotchy. All right, Tiffany asks: Once a complaint is sent to the EOC by the plaintiff's counsel, what is the average time frame if known? It depends. It depends on if you if both sides agree to alternate dispute resolution, so mediation. I've honestly seen mediation take up to six months, um, longer in certain situations. If it does not, um, I can tell you that if there's no mediation, our cases tend to resolve before the nine-month mark. That is not, I believe, standard for every firm. And it's also not that standard for unrepresented plaintiffs. Marcus Anderson says, can claims in one charge, e.g. harassment in the charge, can claims in one charge, e.g. harassment is the charge, but you also have sexual harassment, retaliation, um, et cetera. Can you have one claim alone that has different elements you gain damages from? Uh, so each claim has a set pool of damages. So if you have a discrimination claim, you have economic damages and emotional damages. If you have a sexual harassment claim, you also have economic damages and emotional damages. If you have a retaliation claim, you have punitive damages. Now, if you go and file for civil harassment, which I think is what you're saying here, you could try to argue that's a different pool of damages, but and it's going to depend somewhat on the laws of your jurisdiction, but I would expect that would still be the same pool of economic and emotional damages. I could be wrong. I literally had no cough all day, and I got on live, and now I have a cough. Trey Morse asks us, is there a statute of limitations for filing a perjury complaint? Almost certainly there is. It's going to depend on where you are, the, juris the laws of the jurisdiction you are in, which I do not know and would not be allowed to tell you anyways, and you're not asking about an employment um, law. Big Poppy Birad says, great, great username. I was fired for complaining about safety violations. I worked for a warehouse through a temp agency, and now I'm in the OSHA investigation process. I was fired by the warehouse and my temp agency. Big Poppy Brad goes on to a second part of the question. And, oh, and the temp agency is now claiming that I signed a paper saying I can't file for retalia uh, retaliation unless I let my temp agency know I was retaliated against afterwards. Do you think a jury would overlook this as clear evidence for wrongdoing? So, Big Poppy Brad, I suspect that not only would a jury overlook that, but the OSHA investigator will think that is a joke. I think that is like complete nonsense. And um, generally speaking, anyone who tries to keep you from filing a retaliation claim is going to have a bad day. Let me go back. Gregory Alinsky says the factory wants to do preconciliation. 
The state failed to respond. They just responded, but the factory put in to the pre-conciliation in October. I still haven't found work. Can I get more damages? If you haven't found work, your economic damages are growing. Sure. Every day you go by that you're actively trying to find work and you can't find comparable work, your, your economic damages go up. Uh, pre-conciliation is like, it's essentially mediation. It's them trying to get the case settled before they investigate. Uh, Stace Erickson says, Vince, how often do you see cases where an employer followed or watched an employer for a period of time? Watched as in their computer, sat outside their house, or followed them around? Stace, I have had less than five of those in my career. And two of those that I'm thinking about. Um, a lot of the private investigator pressure was actually on the attorneys, not the plaintiff, believe it or not. Um, thank you, Te J. I also like the Fred Flintstone look. I bought some new costumes for live streams. They're coming. Um, we got some fun ones. I think we got a full Roman, like Legionnaire suit of armor. I got a top hat and a, uh, a monocle, um, some other ones. It's going to be fun. Um, I kind of, so the costumes make other attorneys really, really angry. And uh, they send me like mean notes. They're like, you are your fucking joke, like all this stuff. And so that I just want to wear more costumes. <laughs> and also the videos of the costumes perform really, really well. Uh, Mr. D says, I totally hear, ooh, I totally hear what you're saying. And I've spelled out in detail all the wrongdoings by the company. But he acts like he has no idea the facts and says he needs to talk with the actual company. So that, I mean, it's not unheard of for the attorney for the company to want to go talk to the company and do an out, some kind of outsourced investigation. That's fairly normal. Um, but you're going to have to apply leverage because he's going to take a long time to go ahead and do that investigation. <clears throat> Cuppy J says, my employer forced me to leave or do an impossible performance improvement plan. After my attorney sent a demand letter, employer paused this action and has become unresponsive. Can I demand employer for decision of this adverse action? So uh, you can make any demand you want in settlement, but it doesn't mean they're going to listen. If they've already fired you, they're already on the hook for probably punitive damage as well as economic and emotional damages if there's discrimination in your case. So... You know, as long as the case is valid, um, they may think they're already on the hook to pay and they may not want to bring you back or they might bring you back. Have you two have uh, you two states have a great weekend. Uh, viral setting zombie Wilma. Where oh, viral setting zombie says, where's Wilma Flintstone? What, what do you think our costume budget is here, buddy? We're not just buying costumes willy nilly. Come on now. Mark Anderson says, uh, Vince, you're monetizing. You're getting ads like every five to 10 minutes on my end. Congratulations. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, YouTube is very, very good to us. Um, we actually took, we, we spoke with a couple of vendors recently. Uh, people were like, we're going to, we'll come in and optimize your channel. And they're like, what do you make per month from your YouTube channel? I was like, oh, like 1500 bucks usually. And um, give or take, you know, a couple hundred. And they were like, uh, that's not true. I'm like, what? Like, no, we don't think you make that much. And I was just like, well, I mean, I get the checks. So we do. Uh, and they were like, it would be absurd for you to have the subscribers that you have and get that much money. So I have no idea why YouTube likes it so much, but um, I'm glad they do. Big Poppy B Rad says, I appreciate you, man. I've been watching for a while. Keep making content, brother. I appreciate you saying that. I the making these videos always feels so stupid. So it's it's really nice when people are like, "Hey, this this helped me," like because then it makes me like feel less stupid when I'm when I'm doing this stuff. And I mean, I know I don't help my own cause, right? Like certainly, but yeah. Uh, T E J says, "Why is it that companies will retaliate when you file a complaint with the EOC or the Human Rights Commission?" they know this will increase their liability for a legal claim. TJ, usually they don't. So I want to say like nine times out of 10, employers do not retaliate if they get defense counsel involved early. And part of that is defense counsel's first 
order of business is always going to be to triage, to, to keep the claim from getting worse. So they immediately go around and they just tell people not to um, not to retaliate. And a lot of times we'll have clients sit in jobs for years um, because the employer is scared to retaliate. Stace Erickson says, how often are employees reinstated if the company is asking and they turn it down? Does that make them look bad at the EEOC? So employees are, we do see employees reinstated. It's not the most common thing. Um, generally, where an employee is restated, either they're incredibly valuable to the company or the employee very much, very much wants you, uh, wants to go back to work. Uh, but generally, you really got to push um, for reinstatement. Now, the second part of this question is, uh, if the company asks the employee to return and they turn it down, does that make them look bad to the EEOC? No. No, I think it, the EEOC investigators will routinely understand like, oh, you don't want to work at this place because it did horrible things to you. That makes sense. However, the damages, uh, when the company tries to bring you back and you decline, it can impact the growth of your economic damages. Study mode says these are absolutely not stupid. These videos are lifesavers. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. It's very kind of you to say. Uh, on that note, I will remind everyone that if you like this stream, it helps the stream to grow. Uh, catch a kitty. Your video is very informative to people. Please don't feel stupid. I think everyone appreciates it. Oh, thank you. I wasn't I wasn't out for like, I don't know, compliments every day. I just kind of was given given a nod to the idea that this. The, this situation, me just talking to a camera, I think you can imagine it feels kind of silly, right? Um, it's great. And I can tell that we're helping some people because I can I can see the analytics and people call me and like, you know, it, I fundamentally know I think it, it is doing some good, but it just, it's always going to feel silly. And so I always appreciate it when you guys say nice things to me. Thank you. Um, it does feel weird. Catch a kitty. Yeah, it, it absolutely does feel weird. Um, did we answer all the questions? Is this a very short live stream? We've been going for less than 20 minutes. Do we have more questions? I poured two ounces of scotch for this people. Maybe I'm doing too many live streams. Mr. D says, I've applied. I've applied pressure saying I'm going forward and putting my case into federal litigation. And he seems confused. And just ask why I think the company is at fault. Mr. D, do you have an attorney? Uh, I guess you don't because you're talking directly with the lawyer. So listen, this is going to be messing with you. This attorney that you're speaking to could perhaps not be an actual employment attorney. Or it's possible, Mr. D, that you're not stating your claim in an effective way, so the attorney doesn't fear it. Um, any one of those three could be in play here, and I don't mean to insult you. I think you're a very clever guy. I'm not saying that's what's going on. I just have to cover the bases. Uh, study Mode says, if I have to quit because the new job they are offering is setting me up for no success, does that count? So you can argue if you're being offered this new job and, and motivated by some form of discrimination, you can argue that it's a constructive termination and that you're not quitting. You're being constructively terminated because there's no way you could succeed in the role. That is a complex and more difficult argument to make, but that could be um, a viable argument for you to make. Steady mode. Scott says, what is the most egregious situation you made whole for your client? Um, I mean, made whole is, is really a, uh, I mean, define made whole, right? Like if you define made whole as my client accepted a settlement, then I can talk about that. But I actually don't feel like I necessarily make many of my clients whole. I don't think the laws in this field really let us make our clients whole. Like the, the how horrible the things are that are done to my clients generally vastly outstrips the monetary amount that we get for them, in my opinion. And also, um, I mean, some things like, can you really 
fix, I mean, rape. Can you fix rape in the workplace by giving someone a check? I, I would argue, no. I don't think anyone has ever felt that a check made up for getting raped. Um, so, Scott, I didn't mean to, like, go dark on that. But, um, you know, I, I, it depends on your definition of made whole. Cuppy J says, employer paused action to force me to leave and let's... Oh, Cuppy J just deleted that question. Well, but I will not read it. Marcus Anderson says, what's a good way to defend yourself from defendant's request asking to go into previous employment files in order to use an affirmative defense? Marcus, I need a little more context. Um, so the employer's looking to use an affirmative defense and they're asking to go into your previous employment file? I mean, they don't they control the previous employment file or is it an, an employment file from another employer? Study mode says, thank you. Next question. How do you prove and calculate loss of reputation? That is, um, I mean, study mode, the easy answer is you hire an expert witness who does that for a living. The other side will also hire an expert witness who does that for a living. You will have a dueling expert witnesses. You have litigation about whose experts are qualified. You will have litigations about whose experts are better. You will have testimony from both experts as to what the reputational damage is. And then ultimately, a judge, a jury, or an arbitrator will decide whose who's expert witness is correct about the reputational damage that was incurred, um, which is probably not the most satisfying answer, but that is functionally the best answer I can provide you. Gabriel's Tears says, I was terminated and they labeled it a reduction in force. I was also reporting discrimination before the layoff. Could they use the mass layout to say I would have been laid off anyways? Yes, they absolutely can. So Gabriel's tears, this happens a lot. You will see a lot of people who are who are engaged in protected activity, like complaining of discrimination, complaining of sexual harassment, get tossed into layoffs. And it does add risk to your case because a jury or a judge or an arbitrator could decide, hey, uh, it wasn't retaliation. It's just a major layoff. Now, what you have to argue and what you have to convince people of is that you were thrown into the layoff, not because you were going to be laid off anyways, but because you were engaged in protected activity. And they then stuck you in the layoff because you were a thorn in their side. Uh, Big Poppy Birad says, so far in the OSHA investigation, I haven't given every piece of proof, photos, emails to my investigator. Should I have already done that? Will they ask for it later? I just didn't want to give it. Second part of the question. Got to find the second part of the question. The opposition, all the info I had until the opposition speak and reveal themselves. When dealing with OSHA, sometimes you got to you, you got to keep OSHA interested. OSHA is a little overwhelmed. So you may want to consider giving a little bit more to your OSHA investigator. You may want to consider getting everything to your OSHA investigator to try to like convince the OSHA investigator that she or he can like do some good here with minimal labor. That's a really good way to get an OSHA investigator to do their job. Okay, Stace Erickson says, I started a new job this week after being let go a year ago. I'm making a little more than I was before, but the bennies are way less. How does this look for my case? Does it devalue it? So you've probably cut off your economic damages from growing, at least in terms of wages. You can make an argument for the benefits. Um but if you're earning more anyways, the value of the additional pay is probably greater than the value of the benefits. So you haven't gotten rid of your already accrued economic damages. Whatever economic damages you already accrued are still there. It's just that from the moment you took that job that was higher paying, your economic damages stopped growing. Uh, Danielle says, what documentation, if any, are employers required to keep when an employee raises a complaint of discrimination internally? Everything. So, I mean, your initial demand letter should include a discovery freeze for everything related or, or even tangentially related. Um, and anything that gets destroyed, that ends, that's going to be construed against the employer, generally speaking, once they're on notice. Ah, Marcus, if Marcus Anderson is, is hoping to keep his current employer that he's litigating with from getting their hands on your prior employment files from other employers, um, make a motion, fight them, refuse to hand over, make, force them to make a motion to compel and discovery, and then oppose that motion to compel. 
Integrity Matters says, what happens when an employer lies and says you quit, but then you have them on recording terminating you? Also, what happens if you miss the deadline to turn their position statement with the EOC? Oh, they missed their deadline? Okay. So first answer, if they say you quit, but you say, well, you have a recording of them terminating you, then one, you're probably going to qualify for unemployment. And two, um, if it matters for your case, and it should, because then you don't have to make a constructive termination argument, then you should probably be able to prove that portion of your case, that you were terminated. And if the termination is your negative workplace consequence, which certainly sounds like it could be, then that's one element in your case that's easier to prove. Uh, the second part of that question, what happens if you miss the, if the employer misses the deadline to turn in their position statement with the EOC? Generally, the EOC will give them more time. But remember, if the employer is a private employer and the EOC just gets nothing from them, they could theoretically take it to enforcement, but in reality, they're just going to issue your right to sue letter and you're going to go on to federal court. Copy J says, thank you, Vince. I mean, I am still employed. My attorney sent a demand letter before the employer terminates me. Employer paused the action, forcing me out and let the statute, let, let status pending investigation play games to avoid liabilities. Can I demand them to finish the investigation so I can admit the action is a mistake? Yeah, you can absolutely make that demand. You can certainly make that demand. Um, but they're going to do whatever they think is best for them. Mr. D, we're, Mr. D and I have been going back and forth answering a couple of questions. And Mr. D says, I completely understand what you're saying. My gut tells me this attorney is just a generic corporate attorney that doesn't have a specific specialty. Should I just blow past them and get my right to sue letter? If you have access to representation for federal court, then absolutely. And if you don't mind being on a public docket, yes. The reason to stay in the EOC is um, to avoid the complexity of federal litigation, right, if, if you're not represented, and to keep your case private. Uh, John Doe, yes. The audio has always been clear, believe it or not. Oh, John Doe says, wait a minute, is the audio clear? And John Doe, yeah, the audio on the live streams is almost always clear, believe it or not. Okay, Sean S. says, hi, Vince. Where would a case be if you work in Manhattan but live outside of Manhattan? Should a right to sue letter be issued? I would argue, Sean, that the case you would want to keep it in Manhattan, and you have every right to do so. And in Manhattan, you would have access to the federal laws, the New York state laws, and the New York City laws if you're bringing a workplace discrimination or workplace sexual harassment case. And the New York City law is among the best in the nation. Top, excuse me, top two in my opinion, certainly. Uh, study mode says, is a sham investigation a corrective action? Rules say the employer knew or should have known that the harassment took place and the employer failed to take corrective action. Study mode, they might be trying to give the appearance of taking corrective action now. I mean, what they're trying to do is do, I guess you believe they're doing a sham investigation, right? So if they're doing a sham investigation, what they're hoping to do is do the sham investigation and convince someone, judge, jury, arbitrator, that it wasn't a sham and that it was a legitimate corrective action, right? That's what they're that's what they're going for. Uh, Ron Hammersley, does winning or losing an unemployment claim help in a retaliation case? Honestly, unemployment hearings and the determination made at them are not really that useful. However, however, evidence that you obtain from an unemployment hearing or sometimes the transcript or the recording, whatever you might have, from an unemployment hearing can often end up being useful evidence in a later litigation. So the finding in the unemployment hearing is kind of like, and this happens all the time, and I'm not saying this to you, uh, Hammersley, Mr. Hammersley, Ron Hammersley. Um, but a lot of times people will like harp in their in their consultation with an employment attorney, like, and I won my unemployment hearing. And instantly employment attorneys just like check out. They're like, nobody cares. That's not a thing. That's not even a real judge. That's like a, like a, generally you can consider like a unemployment ALJ, administrative law judge to be like, on par or maybe slightly below like a traffic magistrate. Uh, what do we have? Um, Scott Nurberger says in Ohio, some charges get referred to the attorney general. That That's possible, certainly. Stace Erickson says, how far in the future they value your losses? 
Stace, that's fact specific. That's going to depend on your industry, your earning potential, how easy it is to find you employment, if you have a mitigation journal, all these things. John Doe says, is the new setup right? No. John Doe, so I actually went a step further than what you recommended. I have all of the professional microphone and the professional like external audio card and everything uh, waiting at the post office, but I went ahead and ordered a rather, not going to lie, rather sick computer um, from Newegg that is like positively beastly, like 64 gigs or really high in RAM. Like it, it's nice. Uh, cause I kind of just had enough. I don't want the clicking to go anymore. And also like my computer hangs for whatever reason, when I'm like trying to upload videos, like if I, if I like make videos to upload and then I'm done for the day and then I want to play a computer game, computer gets a little, a little slow and I, I want to play hell divers too. So, you know, I bought a new PC. Um, and I also just want to make sure that clicking is gone. And also, if I'm if I'm ripping out all these cords and everything to install the new microphone and everything, uh, I want to just do it once. So like, I have a upgraded phone from the firm that I'm going to install. I have the new computer, the new professional microphone, the new external audio, uh, all the things. I'm very excited, and I, I think that should all be here tomorrow. Uh, Bethel Abraham says, "What happens when a case is prematurely dismissed before the formal complaint process?" And the agency manipulated, fabricated the EEO timeline dates to justify the dismissal, and you have substantial proof. The matter is on appeal now. Well, that's that's what happens. It, hopefully, you appeal it, and hopefully, you win your appeal. Um, the idea would be that if you're, and I assume you are correct, but if you're able to show on the appeal that you're correct, um, and that there was, you know, an appealable question of law here, then it should be sent for, it should be remanded to be looked at again. I would hope de novo from, you know, a completely fresh look. Copy, happy to help. I hope I helped. Sean, happy to help. Hope I helped. Uh, my other channel says, because of award limits and federal court being 300K, if a claimant feels this case may garner punitive damages of a larger amount, should they file in state court instead? My other channel, remember, when you're filing in federal court, you are also potentially, hopefully, bringing your state and local claims as well. And the limitations in federal court are for federal laws. And listen to we can talk about those federal limitations. That's a whole nother conversation. But the main thing is when you're in federal court, you're not giving up the damage calculation of the state court law because you're in federal court. Right? You don't, the federal judge can be like, okay, so this case is properly in federal court. And we have federal, we have questions of federal law here that we're addressing. However, we also have questions of state and local law that we're addressing in the same action. Right. So don't, um, don't panic and also have that conversation with your attorney. Like your attorney should be able to answer those questions for you. Study mode asks us, can someone be deposed more than once? How do attorneys decide who gets deposed or who gets deposed first? So generally, uh, if I mean, it would have to be kind of an extravagant situation. Like there'd have to be a really good reason to depose someone twice, but yes, it certainly can happen. You also can have de depositions that take longer depending on the local rules um, than one day. And the person comes back for a second day. And often that second day of deposition is not consecutive in days. They'll have some time in between in terms of how to attorneys decide who gets deposed first. Um, it's a fight. Like everybody wants the other side's people all deposed first um, because there's advantages there. Uh, and listen, there's, there's obviously some, there's some things that are tradition that they happen in a certain order, but schedules get kind of um, foobarred. And then uh, you're all just trying to get your people um, done last. The people you're defending done last. Marcus Anderson says, in a hearing, defendants spoke on use of prior deposition to be admitted. But once I spoke up on their move to summary judgment and failed, the conference ended. Is that good? Let me read that again so I see if I understand that. In a hearing, the defendant spoke on the use of a prior deposition to be admitted. 
But once I spoke up on their move to summary judgment and failed, the conference ended. Is that good? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Marcus. I don't understand. John Doe, yes, we do. I mean, it's not a stream specific computer. I mean, I may use this computer as stream specific, although this computer is, is the one with the artifacts, so I don't know um, about that. Viral setting zombie, it's kind of you to keep your mind on my money. And I always chuckle when you talk about how much money I have. Actually, I have a funny story about that. Um, I was talking, this is probably, I don't know, maybe like a year ago, I was talking with an actress. Um, like a very, like a talented actress, movies, like been in theaters in this past year, really successful TV shows, really talented. Um, definitely a person who like went through life with both looks and talent and, you know, good for her, you know, no harm, no foul. Um, just most of us don't get that. Right. And, um, I, I'd passed a comment to this woman, like, um, I guess maybe I shouldn't say actress anymore this actor, I, this thespian. Um, although is that, is that live theater only? I, I, I don't know. I don't know the industry. So I had said like um, something to the effect of like, there's nothing left for me to want. Like I have everything I want. And I remember her kind of giving me like the stink eye, like, I know I have more than you and I still want things. And um, it, I think it kind of blew her mind that I was like, yeah, you do have more than me. You definitely have more than me. You, you're quite famous. Like, uh, you do very well for yourself. You've been a working actor for decades, right? Like successfully. Um, and I have not. In fact, I can't even say that I practiced law for decades yet. You know, I think we're at 14, 15 years at this point, something in that range. Um, but my point was not that I had more than the actor. My point was that I had nothing left to want and that I just didn't want as much as perhaps she wanted. So I was good. So viral setting zombie, I appreciate you talking about how much money I have. And I am very comfortable. Like, But fundamentally, part of what makes me comfortable is uh, I don't want anything else. I have everything that I want, um, which I like a great deal. All right, back to, uh, whoa, we had some questions pop up. Good. That's actually good. We took that uh, sidestep there to let questions build up. Um, yes, uh, Katcha Kitty, I went for the 64 gigabytes of high-end RAM. I also went for, I think, an Intel i9. Um, I can actually look it up if you're interested. I mean, I have the email. We have the receipt. Uh, the Zinro says, te Zinro, how, how do you, how do you do your elite speak? T3H Zinro, is it te or, I, I assume that's an E. Um, asks us, if you know your employer has had to settle discrimination cases previously, what's the best way to leverage that for your case's benefit? So go on Pacer, find the prior cases and find whatever you can about the settlements. There might not be much because in many jurisdictions, the settlements are um, confidential. But if you can find a pattern, find if any of those cases involve people that are involved in your case, right? Often employers might keep someone who was involved in a case who was a bad actor. Often those cases will have evidence on public dockets that might not paint the company or the decision makers or the bad actors involved in your case in a positive light. And that can be really useful for you so, you know, do the digging. It's always useful. Um, thank you, John Dale. I appreciate that. We, we do what we can. Um, Mr. D says, thanks, Vince. I truly respect your opinion and advice. Thank you. It's very kind of you. I'm dealing with a major Fortune 500 company, more like Fortune 50. Fortune 50 will not be thrifty. They will, they will spend some money on that case. Uh, and they are just strong army me at every avenue. It's literally David versus Goliath. It absolutely is. But, but, and I got to tell you, Mr. D, if you're, if you're fighting a fortune 50 company, I don't want to be the guy who's like, you need an attorney, but like, eh, think about it. Like it, if you were my family and you didn't have an attorney, I would literally, I would, <laughs> I would force attorneys to go to your door and try to represent you. If you were my family, you didn't have an attorney to fight a fortune 50 company. Um, you can 
You can confirm that with my sister. <laughs> uh, gotcha. Kitty says, do you find smaller businesses tend to skate on federal regulations around discrimination? I keep running into under 20 employee loopholes. And I find it puzzling this is allowed for discrimination. Remember, Katja, the uh, federal discrimination laws were largely drafted uh, to defend employers. So there's many things in them that are real head scratchers. But also remember that you, there's a lot of ways to get to the employee threshold to, to activate the EOC. And in addition to that, listen, there's also state and local laws, which often have much lower thresholds, right? There's a lot. I mean, listen, in New York, you're talking like four employees, right? Jay says, can you explain front pay and back pay? Uh, is that on top of discrimination damages as an additional charge? You got to look at the uh, damage calculation playlist. We're going to we're gonna get into those concepts way more in depth than we can do here. So like your damages for discrimination are the economic damages. It's going to be both back pay, front pay. You can prove some kind of reputational damage, like all these things, right? And it's going to be your emotional damages, and those will be separate. But those are the two forms of damages that come out of a discrimination in the workplace claim. Uh, study mode says, do you have to answer? Have you ever questions in a deposition or can you ask for it to be more narrow or relevant? For example, would an adult need to go into an expunged middle school situation? Um, so in federal court under most, most local rules, um, you do actually have to answer questions to some extent, but like doesn't mean the stuff's going to be admitted later, right? Like, so if somebody asks a ridiculous question, like never have you ever, I don't know, we'll just pretend we're the plaintiff in this. Never have you ever forcibly touched a woman, right? And like, and I know study mode, this is not you. We, we went as a plaintiff in this, this has got nothing to do with you. Um, that, that, deponent, that person being deposed would be like, uh, no, never. I don't think so. And, and then we could be like, well, even in middle school, which I hope the answer is still no, but that person would probably just be like, I, I don't remember. And, and in both of those questions, the attorney would probably lodge objections, but often under the federal, the federal rules, you're still going to have to answer the question. And then the fight about what will be admitted comes later which is very strange. <sighs> Scott says, how does applying state law and federal court work? Is that not an improper venue? It is not. Um, it is a proper venue. So federal judges have the power to administer federal law, state law, local law in this kind of action uh, without question. That is well settled. I, I understand what you're saying. Like, it, it doesn't make sense that a federal judge can administer state law. Like, that obviously feels weird. But, like, you're not going to go have three cases in three courts for the federal claims, the state law claims, and the local claims, right? Uh, Stace says, Vince, since I started my new job, I'm paranoid about using my vacation time since I know... There's going to be days for court. How many days on average does a person need for court ballpark? Um, it, I mean, it. every case is different. Every case is absolutely different. I generally tell people to budget two weeks of business days, so 10, 10 days. I, we have had cases be on trial longer than that. It's incredibly rare, um, incredibly, incredibly rare. Scott, oh, whoa, my chat jumped. Ah. My chat jumped. Uh, uh, ba, 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 okay. I think I missed some stuff. John Doe is giving a is giving a SIP Pro class from law school, which I wish John Doe would attend. But I think John Doe could do a lot of good, and I think John Doe has a good work knowledge of the law. Um, Des Zinro, te, te. I knew it was Leet Speak, te. I knew it. Okay. Uh, Scott Niebarger says, I-9s are awesome. You can do crunching in the background. I'm playing a game. Yes. I'm excited. Actually, when you said an I-9, I thought you were talking about a car. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about the computer. Oh, Katja says it's a good processor as well. Yeah, I'm super excited. It's um, it's really nice right now 
that we can get some computer components um, because there's a little less demand, I think, from the, the folks trying to crunch cryptocurrency. Okay, we have SEK4110 saying, it is my understanding that compensatory damages are cap. Is forward pay considered compensatory? Are emotional damages included in the cap? SEK4110, okay, so yes, there are some hard and soft caps on the federal damages and the way those are calculated. Generally, I do not spend a lot of time discussing those caps because you need to also apply state and local laws, which often do not share those caps or have different caps. So if I go around being like, oh, here's the cap on your case, one, there are people going to be like, well, it's not worth it for me then. I don't want to bring my case, even though they could actually potentially win much more than that. Two, um, it's it's going to make people feel like what happened to them is devalued. And it's actually not, I mean, to be clear, what happened to you will be devalued. This process is horrific and it will devalue what actually happened to you because they're assigning dollar bills to a horrible, I mean, essentially a hate crime, right? Um, but those caps are not really as limiting as folks tend to believe because again, state and local laws. Mark Sanderson says, defendant asked to use prior deposition and, and SEK 4110, let me just note, that's for private employers, right? If you're a federal employee, you're subject to the federal law and you probably don't have protections beyond that. Okay, Marcus Anderson says, defendant asked to use prior deposition from state level, so I spoke up on defendant's move on, let me read that again. Defendant asked to use prior deposition from the state level, so I spoke up on defendant's move on a summary judgment and failed the conversation ended. No talk on the matter, I was laughing. So it sounds like they were asking for leave to pursue summary judgment. You opposed it. And they dropped it. And that sounds positive. I mean, listen, if you don't have to spend time opposing a summary judgment motion. My hat's off to you. My, uh, my hat's off to you. I have no self-respect. None whatsoever. Um, Study mode, my coworker and roommate was using the job to coerce and sexually harass. I asked to be changed to a new team. They refused. I was constructively terminated. He moved, leaving me with a lease and trying to find study modes next. Next statement. I don't think... It went on and no income to pay rent or move or qualify for the new place to live. I've had to borrow. Can those damages be used in the damage calculation? Your tangential damages, like your rent and stuff like that, um, probably is not going to be um, probably is not going to be that likely to be included in your economic damages. I mean, you can always try, but it's a bit of a it's a bit of a push. Uh, but but Sean S, are union involved discrimination cases considered taboo by employment attorneys? Thanks, Mr. Vinstone. Great, I like that, Mr. Vinstone. So I do not think that all unions are created equal. Generally, I am pro union for obvious reasons. Love me some Shrugtober. Big fan of uh, certain unions. Let's face it, though, a lot of unions are super corrupt. They're collecting workers' money, and they're doing nothing for it. And often, they are good old boys clubs where they protect really super bad people. So where cases have bad activity by the union, I bring it. And and I, I'm happy to sue the union as well if they're failing. Um, we've brought failure to represent cases against unions. We've brought discrimination, sexual harassment cases against unions, retaliation cases. And, and you wouldn't believe how often unions will be complicit in an employer's retaliation. It happens. It happens. There's a lot. I've had cases with like fist fights at union rallies because my client dared to speak up and like 
family members being targeted by other union members who are like in the chain of like the stuff gets wild. Ted Zinro says the level of collective trauma in this chat warrants a group hug. We've been through some crap. Y'all have. That's fair. That's that's really, really true. I very much agree with that statement. And I hope, I mean, listen, if you guys form a support group online, I would I would send the coffee and donuts. Alfalfa says, hi, Vince, loving the outfit. Thank you. My question is, is it typical or at least not unheard of to go through multiple rounds of mediation? Very common. If so, when would multiple rounds be reasonable? So Alfalfa, multiple rounds are reasonable when both parties want to get the settlement done and the mediator is actually useful. I've got a lot of mediations that I go to where, frankly, there's no point in additional mediation because opposing counsel and I both know that we're going to get this case settled. And we both know about where we're going to get it. Like, I know what my client wants. And opposing counsel is like, I just got to get my my guy there. Right? So at that point, am I going to go a second day of mediation? Some, let me choose my words carefully. Some fine fellow or 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 talented woman doing absolutely nothing to advance my cause. Uh, no, I'm not going to pay that person, whatever it is, the, the two, three grand they want for the day. I'm going to say, okay, Pierre, you know what I want. Go get it. And Pierre is going to say, uh, all right, give me a week. Uh, and you work with opposing counsel. However, counterpoint, some mediators do work. They do serious work. I can think of uh, a mediator in New York, mediator slash arbitrator in New York named uh, Marty Scheinman, who does incredible things and can be really, really super helpful on cases. And I've gone multiple days of mediation because I thought that mediator was worth it. And I thought that mediator, like, and, and often it's, it's a situation where one or both of the parties can't see their way to like the reality of the situation. Like I'll have a client who's like, I want my 30 million. And it's like, okay, sure. But um, you would have to work 20 years to earn 1 million. So we're not getting there in economic damages. And um, I don't have to tell you this because I do think you were wrong. I think you were horribly wrong. But no one thinks you were 29 million wrong. You know, and and that mediator might need to sit you down and be like, let's look at these cases that made seven figures. What's different about those cases and yours? What happened and how how capable they were of proving it? Your situation is different in a variety of ways. So you don't have a $30 million case. And that's a hard conversation. And as the attorney, it's easy for the client to feel the attorney's like selling them out. And so like having the mediator just be like, I, I think you should have $500,000, but not 30 million. Like that can be really valuable. And I, I've definitely, I've had mediators uh, who I think they ended up like going out to drinks with my client, like months later, like not for like a date, like as a commit, like they like cried together during the mediation and I'm sitting there emotionally unavailable. Like you guys all right? Like you want me to, you want to go get like water? You want, I can make you tea. Like, and the media, they're sitting there like sobbing, you know? And um, it was a bonding thing and it helped my client a great deal. And so I kept using that mediator, not because she was strong arming my client, but because my client was getting support from that mediator and it helped my client to engage in the process and to get what my client wanted. And, and that, that, is that worth three grand a day? To me, it is. Um, okay, what do we got next? Whoa. Uh, we lost. Uh, my other channel, your attorney. Oh, I'll read the question. Uh, my other channel says, my attorney wants to file in state court. He believes that federal judges are too conservative and not usually side with the employee. Uh, it depends on your jurisdiction. Your attorney could be correct. So... Not every jurisdiction is a jurisdiction where you, if, if I have a case in the Bronx in New York, I'm probably filing it in the Bronx in New York, the state court, because I want that Bronx jury, right? If i um, got a case in Staten Island in New York, I'll tell you right now, the case is going to federal court because I want that diversified jury pool because Staten Island's a little conservative these days. I mean, kind of always. Matthew says, is the expected winnings greater in one lawsuit with 50 claims or five lawsuits with 10 claims each, emotional damages, economic, et cetera? 
Matthew, it depends what the claims are. If you're talking about 50 different claims of workplace discrimination, then no, the pool of damages doesn't really change um, between those 50. I don't understand. So I guess you're filing. Yeah, I guess I would need to know what the claims are to really answer this question. Because you're saying 50 claims in one lawsuit or five lawsuits, 10 claims each. Um, I mean, I, I would think the employer would seek to consolidate those five lawsuits for the sake of efficiency and the expense of defending them. Uh, defending five lawsuits is much more expensive for the employer than defending one with 50 claims. Uh, Mr. D, yeah, I would talk to the national. Oh, so Mr. D says, I agree. I should have an attorney 100%, but where I live, there's literally no one that will even listen to my case because they don't do employment law or they are beyond swamped and aren't taking on new cases. Question mark, question mark. Mr. D, that's what uh, the, the national firms are for, right? So uh, we're very expensive. I don't, I would rather you get a better deal. Consider like Gloria Allred. I mean, that she's she's a good national option. Um, and there's, you know, there's some others. I generally get a little uncomfortable with the personal injury firms that are national that take employment cases that, that gives me the agita, it gives me the concern, but, um, you know, better than no representation at all for sure. Uh, what do we have here? Okay. So Matthew says, could I realistically sue an entity repetitively forever because of public accommodation discrimination? Yeah. If they don't fix the public accommodation failure you can sue them over and over and over again. In fact, there's attorneys who do that. There's attorneys who run, I mean, I don't, um, I actually have a story about public accommodation right now as well, but um, there's attorneys who like take vans of people who need uh, accommodations around to businesses and like take them into the business. And then the business like doesn't have the correct ramp or whatever it is they need to have for accommodations. And then the attorney will sue that employer. I mean, not that employer, that that business. Often they target small mom and pop businesses because they don't have the war chest to fight off the lawsuit. And um, those attorneys will hit the same businesses, frankly, year after year after year, if not multiple times in the year. Um, I've repeatedly been approached by firms who like want us to go in on those schemes and we are we are employment attorneys. We are not interested in that kind of litigation. Uh, NYC Damages says EOC asks for witnesses. They want name, contact information, and a brief statement of what they will say. How do you go about this? The witnesses also don't know what it means and who writes it. Uh, I mean, you're writing it or your attorney's writing it for the EOC investigator. You're trying to take some of the work off the EOC investigator's desk. Essentially, you're trying to give them a summary of what a given witness can give them um, so, you know, whatever you, you must have a reason why you're giving the witness, right? If the witness saw something happen, be like, well, the witness saw this happen. And this is important for my case because X, Y, and Z. Uh, Scott, I tend to agree with you that if you are living paycheck to paycheck, late fees are economic damage, but I do think it's unlikely that your late fees will be included in the economic damages in your at least under the federal laws, economic um, damages for your discrimination case. Sean S. says, thank you, Mr. Vinstone. My pleasure. Uh, Small Brown Dog says, I'm suing my employer for whistleblower retaliation and since bringing a lawsuit, they have been granted state and federal grants despite whistleblower retaliation violators being ineligible, FCA. Yeah, I mean... They're not guilty yet, I presume. You have a lawsuit going, but it sounds like a civil lawsuit. So uh, they have probably not been tagged as uh, people who retaliate against whistleblowers yet. <clears throat> Ooh. Oh, Stace Erickson says, thanks for the hospitality, Vince. You've been a rock star. Thank you. Have another drink and relax that cough. Cheers. Cheers. NYC Damages says or asks, who picks the mediator when you file in federal court and are told to go to mediation first? And is this with the judge or is this a different type of mediation? Thanks, Vince. Uh, 
I didn't mean to skip your question, Godine. Godine family, please ask it again. I did. So the chat. So I, I see that I've I've missed multiple questions here. What you need to understand is that the chat leaps forward all of a sudden on me, and I often have trouble finding questions. So Godine family, fifth, please ask your questions again. Um, I would love to answer those questions. I'm not skipping your questions on purpose. NYC damages. I think I already read this, but they ask us who picks the mediator when you file in federal court. So generally speaking, mediators are picked by both counsel, by both attorneys, or if you're not represented by you and opposing counsel. Now in federal court, there is often a mediation program where the federal court system provides mediators. But the thing that's gotten weird recently is that you will pick a mediator in federal court and usually that mediator is free. Usually the mediators in federal court are free mediators who are trying to get mediation experience so they can open a mediation practice. But they're not all free. But in many federal court systems, it is actually inappropriate for them to charge you because they're on, and it's it the, the local rules matter, right? Um, so what a lot of them will do is, like snakes in the grass, accept being nominated to be the mediator on a case. And then after some time passes, be like, and by the way, it's 500 an hour. And opposing counsel and plaintiff's counsel will be like, no, you're the, you're the free trash mediator. Like, you don't, you came through the federal court system. You don't know how to do this yet. You're not going to charge us. And mediator's like, what are you going to do? Tell the judge you need a new mediator and you need, you need to delay the case. And sometimes you do frankly. Um, but that's not true. Like some federal court systems are fine with these mediators charging and they, and they do so. So, you know, um, keep an eye on that. Uh, John Doe says, Vince, you're right. I should consider law school. Yes, you should. And a career representing folks with issues like myself. Yes, you should. If my issue resolves reasonably well, then it's the path I'll take. There's gold in them, their hills. Yes. Uh, I will say that employment law, to the best of my knowledge, is the single greatest way to turn time and attention to detail and irrational aggression into money. Um, what do we have? Can the employer insist you file a restraining order to prove the sexual harassment? Uh, I don't think filing the restraining order proves the sexual harassment, but filing the restraining order... I mean, I could, I could see the employer being like, listen, we need you to file a, a restraining order, especially if they pay for it, pay for the attorney to help you with it. Um, because they want to keep you safe. Like I, I can, I can see why they would want you to do that. Um, Noriega, one of the last ones, how's it going, buddy? Long time. Is the employer's position statement, uh, a point where the opposing attorney decides that he, she will move forward with the case? Yes. Um, creating a position statement is a great way for the employer's counsel to understand how, Fooked she or he is uh, in terms of defending this case. And remember that defense counsel are always deciding which cases they will take to trial to bill so much money and win, hopefully, and which cases they will settle because they're probably not going to win a trial. Gardena family says, does a PTSD diagnosis increase the value of an employment discrimination or sexual harassment, or sexual assault case? I mean, simple answer is yes. Generally speaking, PTSD diagnoses will be um, valuable to increase the emotional damages figure. No question. Um, my other channel says, in my rebuttal, should I go over each paragraph of their position statement and explain why they are wrong? Also to clarify the situation because their attorney explained work processes and situations incorrectly. My other channel, I have a rebuttal 101 video that specifically answers this in a much longer format than I can provide here. Uh, I think it's literally like, if you search rebuttals 101, that's the video on my channel. I'd highly recommend that. It's going to be way more valuable uh, to you than whatever I can say here. We have the one hour mark. We have it one hour. It's actually one hour, five minutes. I started early, but one hour. We have one hour to go. And then it's dinner time, people. Dinner time. Remember, when you like the stream, it helps. It helps the stream. It helps the channel. And it costs you nothing. So I appreciate you all very much. Okay, uh, NYC damages, discriminate against me. I complained, immediately fired me for using approved paid leave. 
then denied me unemployment because they say I quit without good cause. Can I file the paid leave separate from the discrimination case? That would be more complex and is just in the EOC. Okay. So NYC damages, I see that NYC in your name. So I'm assuming the paid leave you're referencing is New York paid family leave. That would go to the workers' compensation board. And yes, you can file that separately. Now, keep in mind, though, two things. One, uh, there's some minor overlap in damages. So what you win at the workers' compensation board, excuse me, may be removed or at least more difficult to obtain later in your litigation or discrimination. But also, any settlement you achieve in the workers' compensation board will require a carve-out for your other claims so that the universal uh, releases you execute don't extinguish your other claims. Please remember that. Alfalfa. Vince, is depression and anxiety the only way to have emotional damages? No. Not at all. Lately, I've been finding myself in a constant state of rage due to the betrayal from one of those we're all in the family type employers. Yeah, that that is not, um, there are many paths to emotional damages and depression and anxiety is but one. Um, I would also say that I, and I'm not a mental health professional, but PTSD is not depression. And it's not, I mean, listen, there's some anxiety tied in PTSD, but it's not anxiety. It's a different thing, right? SCK4110 says, in your experience, do company EEO departments ever side with the complainant? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are rare cases of a true believer in the HR department or the internal EEO department. Also, and this is much more common, where a case is so egregious or so easily provable that the EEO department clearly determines that the only way to protect the company is to do the right thing, they will then do the right thing. Right. That's that's always kind of my point about HR. HR exists to protect the company. And the only time they will help you is when helping you helps the company. So, yes, that absolutely happens. It's just not something that happens as often as we would like. Uh, YouTube user Fifth says, I have an open case of the EOC for discrimination, age, sex, race, and disability. That is a lot of protected classes. After ending a relationship with my manager, she made life on the job hell. Compl I complained and was terminated in my options. Make a settlement demand. If you don't settle your case, get an attorney. Those are your best options. Um, I mean, that's overly simplified, but that's a great approach. Like, that's what I would do if I was you. Okay, Jeff Lawler says, what is the best way to prove age discrimination and layoffs? Um, I mean, first check if they balance for age. Many layoffs are actually balanced for age. So they're going to be very careful that they lay off the same number of people above and below 40. So, you know... Check that first, but generally speaking, you can get the data on who was laid off and you can get their ages and then you can say, hey, the termination rate for people over this age was such and such higher than the termination rate for people below 40, right? Uh, Matthew, my magistrate judge, was educated and taught for the university I'm suing. Oh, Matthew, are you, are you Matthew who's asked as many questions uh, as a professor? Um, my magistrate judge was educated and taught for the university I'm suing. He gave me sanctions for making too many motions to edit the complaint. Should I change venues or is it not worth it? Um, if if you truly believe that this magistrate judge is showing favoritism to your defendant because, you know, it's the alma mater, I would, I would, you can consider making a motion to have that judge recuse her or his self. Uh, that's a big move, and I hope you have an attorney if you're going to do it. Karina Marie says, hey, Vince, I filed a sexual harassment charge of discrimination with the EOC. I did my interview, and a few days later, my investigator told me that I need to find representation. Then I will be... Karina, what? Oh, given a right to sue letter. Okay, so your EOC investigator is doing you a favor here, to some extent whatever reason, the investigator doesn't believe that the case is going to settle. So she or he is holding your right to sue letter to give you more time to find counsel because they don't believe you can represent yourself in federal court. That's not an insult. Almost no one can represent themselves in federal court. Um, I would not want to represent myself in federal court, just to be clear. So if this investigator gives you the right to sue letter, you only then have 90 days from the day you receive the right to sue letter to get filed in federal court. 
And listen, can you find an attorney and get filed in that time? Sure. People do it all the time. Is it difficult? Is it an extra layer of challenge? Yes. Having more time helps. So I think it is um, useful. And this investigator is not harming you, but is helping you. Nori Noriega, one of the last ones. Noriega, I actually have a friend who's in Colombia right now, which I know is not where Noriega was, but like, I somehow like, never mind. That was a dumb. Those are two different places. And also, you might not mean the Noriega. You might mean somebody else. So I apologize. Um, what is the attorney looking for from the EOC after we submit our rebuttal statements? Like, what's next? Uh, probably some potential settlement work, some negotiations with the other side, and then just the right to sue letter to go on to federal court. Study mode says, if I make a list of suggested deposition questions for particular people, would that be seen as insulting or helpful by the attorney? I would argue it should be seen as very helpful. Now, you, by the same token, when the attorney doesn't ask questions like, ask them how awesome I am. I, I'm joking. I know it's, I'm making a ridiculous statement that I know you wouldn't actually listen to your questions. But like a lot of people, I had, a, also, I listen, I've had a lot of people be like, we need to, we need to post these 20 people. These 20 people we need to pose. And like I'll be like, what did they see? That's a lot of depositions. What did these 20 people see? They saw everything. They saw the worst stuff. Like, okay. Okay. Like what? Specifics. And then they'll like convince you to do the depositions. And 19 of those 20 people like walk in and, and just tank your case. Or like, no, no, that never happened. None of that ever happened. This guy's a liar. And I'm like, why we, I was going to depose these three people and those three people were all useful. Why, why did you ask for these 19 people who saw nothing good or who are lying about it? And, and the client will just be like, oh, you did the depositions wrong. Okay. All right. Um, but no, but I think that um, giving a list of what each witness saw and like some hypothetical questions for each witness is incredibly useful study mode. And I would, um, if I caught an associate trying to tell a client to like hush up while they were engaged in that, I would not murder that associate, but that is that, that associate would be in peril with me. Um, that, that is also definitely associate work going over like proposed questions for a deposition, not, not necessarily conducting the deposition, but like, the first sweep of the questions before the, before the, whoever's conducting the deposition um, gets to work on the questions and, and combining those questions with the client questions and incorporating client questions would be associate work. So like associates um, better put in the time if they know it's good for them. Uh, Scott asks, referring to your work organization as a family should be against general code of conduct. I generally agree. Um, yes. So NYC damages. Yes, Vince, the New York paid leave, but also the job protected the FMLA. Can you add that when you filed this first and the consequences if different? If not, never mind. I appreciate the live option. Thank you. So NYC damages, the New York PFL claim would go separately. I would argue the FMLA claim will probably go to federal court with your other discrimination claims because it's prohibitively expensive for you to have multiple federal litigations. And that's really, I mean, realistically, that's that's where FMLA claims should be brought um, in, in terms of maximizing damages. So I would urge you to bring the FMLA as a claim in, in the federal lawsuit with the discrimination or the sexual harassment claims. Alfalfa says, I got to hop off. Thank you again for another fun and informative live session. Great weekend. And the cough goes away soon. The cough is way better. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope us all as well. Oh, my other channel says, I want you to know you're so much appreciated. Thank you. I really hope I'm helping. Listen. I'm just one guy on the internet. These are my these are my thoughts and my opinions. Um, so you know, I'm just one guy. Cam says I sent you a message on Instagram. Cam, I do not engage in Instagram. I do not. Uh, we we I think they're I, I think the chat is still on, but we should have an autoresponder up saying that we do not respond to Instagram uh, inquiries. We also don't respond to like TikTok inquiries. There's a couple others. Uh, Facebook Messenger, we don't respond to. Um, when I when I tell you that like stuff got weird, like people's people and bots 
sliding into the DMs um, and just not being um, respectful or uh, being other things. Um, we uh, we shut that all down. So that's why I didn't get back to Instagram. I apologize. Uh, but Cam goes on to say, I was immediately terminated after reporting that a male coworker made a derogatory comment about my physical appearance. Would I have a case? Yeah, I would say so. Scott says, every lawyer has counsel. Yes, Scott, I have many, many attorneys. Um, I have, I mean, I brought one of my attorneys on the channel, Michael Lambert, my criminal attorney, who was, uh, who has taken care of my family members and myself and El Chapo. So hopefully, hopefully helping El Chapo was a little bit more difficult than helping my family. Fifth says, uh, Vince, I made a demand and they returned with a small offer awaiting their position statement for close to four months now. No attorneys in Tennessee seem to be able to assist. I'm pro se. Talk to a national firm. Absolutely. If you if you feel like you need counsel, talk to a national firm. Mr. D says, last question, why would a corporate attorney want to push a state agency to uh, escalate the case to federal court when they could settle it way cheaper at the lower level? Uh, it's seemingly not cost effective. Uh, Mr. D, they may think you don't have a claim and they can get it dismissed much quicker and easier in federal court, or they may believe that you missed some threshold in terms of the statute of limitations or the employee count to bring claims under the federal laws. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, also, listen. There's some really shitty attorneys in the world. They may just want to build, uh, bill your employer more money, right? Like they, that, that happens. Like, oh, federal court, I'll be able to bill them like 200 grand. And so they're fine with escalating it. Uh, I'm not saying any of these things are happening, but it's all possible. Uh, small brown dog, are there any particular stages during the lawsuit that the defense is most likely to come to the table? For example, before discovery, summary judgment motions, Jury draw, trial, etc. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, before depositions and, and sometimes before document discovery are two key moments. So like, if a case doesn't settle early on, often it will settle before someone important gets deposed or before certain documents have to be turned over. Um, and, and those are really good signs. Also, listen. When you're picking a jury, a lot of cases settle. Um, it's the bane of my existence. Like we have a trial team. They're very talented. And um, when a trial date gets set, invariably, the case gets settled. And I hate that. <laughs> like I want the case to go to trial. And it's not the trial team's fault. They're ready for trial. But um, real offers start to come when you know, things feel real for the employer. Uh, this is a strange question. Okay, so Noriega, one of the last ones says, one last question. What is the point of my attorney taking my phone for a period of time collecting evidence? Have you ever done that? If so, what's the purpose? So Noriega, we have paralegals who will assist clients in getting things off their phone, like really important text messages. Uh, for instance, we live, we work in an industry where dick pics are a thing. And, and let's, let's not be, let's not play favorites here. There's a lot of nudes in general from a variety of different genders and the whole, the whole spectrum of sexuality and gender, right? Everyone, everyone loves sending nude pictures of themselves on the internet or, or via phones, uh, apparently. So, um, we will often be like, Hey, are you super tech savvy? And they kind of be like, no, like, great. This here is so-and-so, and they're really good at helping you not delete those incredibly valuable pieces of evidence that are on your phone and getting them off and getting to a safe place. Um, and people will be like, uh, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to give you my phone. And it's like, yeah, we're not going to go through your other stuff and we're not going to tell your spouse. Um but we do, we need to get that off because right now, like right now, if you drop that phone, we could lose so much. And like, 
people will be like, no, it's backed up. The backup's not the same. Often the backup is fallible. There's there's some like the backup for cell phones is not great. Getting it is very difficult. Like there's so many issues. So like I don't take issue with them helping you get stuff off your phone, but like how long do they hold your phone for? That's that's strange to me. Uh, SEK4110 says, one last question. If an internal company EEO department admits guilt, should a person wait to see how the company might settle and make the person whole or get a lawyer? Uh, SEK4110, you're going to get more if you have a lawyer anyways, in my opinion. That's my belief. Um, you want to hear the employer out. If they want to make you an offer, hear them out. But generally speaking, um, if it was you know my family member at my dinner table, I would be chasing them around to get an attorney right off the bat. Uh, Cuppy J says, thank you. You're welcome. I don't remember. I hope I was helpful. Uh, Scott says, I follow a corporate law firm on Twitter because they have the same surname as my mom's maiden name. That makes sense. Catch a Kitty says, no DMs and like hides her eyes. Yeah. So the DMs got real weird. And um, I came to the conclusion that the people who were paying to deal with the DMs were not paid enough to deal with the DMs. Um, and I also kind of was like, uh, this is not a good look to be receiving some of these things um, as an employment attorney. So we just shut it down. Like it's not, that's not a viable means of contacting us. Uh, we're not, we're not into the DMs um, per se. Barbara said, zombie says, stay away from El Chapo. Yeah, I have no, I have no business. I have no beef with El Chapo. I have no, um, business with El Chapo. New York City damages. Uh, no one knows I filed with the EOC. Do you inform witnesses that there are former coworkers still working there, that they could be contacted by the EOC? Uh, you have to be careful of your communications with your witnesses, but like, you know, talk to the investigator about whether or not the investigator is comfortable with you notifying people. Generally, uh, where we can, people know that the investigator is going to reach out. Fifth, happy to help. John Luke Ohen says, how do I prepare after settlement failed? Prepare to litigate. And also, don't think that because settlement failed one time, that settlement's failed forever. Um, it, I mean, over 98% of cases settle in this field, in, in our experience. I don't know about every firm. Uh, NYC damages, what is the statute of limitations on that New York State paid leave law with workers board? Um I don't remember off the top of my head NYC damages. I think we have a video on pursuit, like a walkthrough on pursuing your New York PFL claims. It might have the statute of limitations in there. I don't know the New York PFL statute of limitations because we don't take NY PFL cases because the damages are limited. Um, and it just doesn't make sense for us. Wizzy the Gamer says, hi, Vince. If I have a section 1981 ADA race, disability, gender, breach, whoa, chat jump. Uh, breach of contract and retaliation claim with an attorney who represents me, should I expect settlement? I mean, statistically speaking, you should expect settlement. Yes. It's, it's in part up to you. Um, because, um, you know, if you're asking for a reasonable amount that makes sense for the settlement, then I think settlement chances are very high. Catch says two phones. That's important. Um, I would say, in terms of having DMs for the firm social media, I would not um, I would not want that on my phone at all. Dominique Williams says, are you pro UPS? Have you heard about how horrible UPS is around your legal circle? Yeah. So, Dominic, uh, we have lots of experience with the UPS. Big fan of the union and, and the union action that went on. Uh, but in terms of the UPS itself, yeah, they're pretty horrible. Uh, we've had a lot of experiences. They tried not settling any cases for a while. They thought mathematically that was going to be a good move for them. Um, and it, I don't think it was because I don't think they're doing that anymore. But generally speaking, there's lots of claims against UPS. Um, you know, tough, tough business and uh, lots of people sue them. Nintendo Slim, you are, most, you are more than welcome. I hope the video was helpful. Dominic, you got to read fast up here. The, the chat moves fairly quickly. So it's kind of like, I got to like make it happen. And uh, Dominic, is it Dominic or Dominique? 
I want to get it right. I apologize. And I only ask because I'm used to the Quebecois and uh, different different folks got different pronunciations, you know? And my name is actually Vincent, but I'm Vincent because I'm here. Uh, so, uh, should the, okay, NYC damages, should the employer give the first settlement offer in EUC mediation and then counter that? Or do they tell me to give the first settlement offer? Or is that up to the mediator? So the EOC, the mediator, your attorney, defense counsel, they're all going to want um, you to make the first demand. Holy shit. The pseudonym. Did you become an employment attorney? Are you actually a practicing employment attorney right now? YouTube user pseudonym just said, guess who became an employment attorney? Woohoo. So previously, we've spoken with a young attorney pseudonym about becoming an employment attorney. I'm very excited because she seems to say that she's become an employment attorney. Okay. Uh, Matthew says, I'm getting a lot of spam calls, which I believe to be from opposing counsel. Do I file a protective order? What are some tricks defense counsel uses? I'm not affiliated with uh, any other commentors here. Okay. Matthew, um, I somewhat doubt that defense counsel is spamming you unless they're calling you to try to talk settlement or something like that. It's entirely possible, although their numbers would not show up as spam. So I mean, usually speaking, white shoe defense law firms will have numbers that do not show up as spam accounts. Uh, study mode, if you get a workers' comp settlement, does it reduce the amount you can demand based on salary? I mean, it doesn't reduce the amount you demand, but it does the amount, it does, I mean, it does reduce the amount that you will ultimately win in all likelihood. Mall Cop says, I'm a security guard. I love the username. I, I enjoy the uh, the humor you're injecting there. Uh, I, I'm a security guard. I hurt my arm. My doctor said I couldn't engage in an altercation because I can't defend myself with my right arm. My employer says you can't do your job safely and let me go. Um, I have questions about that. I mean, being a security guard or a mall cop, as you say, right, to, to use your words, generally is not about having altercations. It's about being aware. So I would say that you probably have a claim there. I would view that as a claim. But, I mean, I don't know what kind of, like, like, listen, like, I used to work as a bouncer. If I had only one arm that I could use, I would not have been able to do that job. But a bouncer is not a security guard. Those are two very different gigs, right? Nantana Slim says, uh, I just got a right to sue letter from the EOC with 90 days. What's the best advice to start preparing docs for my attorney? Get a timeline down, which you probably already have from your initial filing with the EOC. Excuse me. Get everything uh, organized as much as you can. Uh, DK asks us, are text messages that have been screenshot with date, time, stamp, okay to use in my case better than nothing? Yes, you can absolutely use that. Um, I would, if you can, preserve the original text message, but yes, certainly screenshots work. My lawyer really wanted the original phone to be used, but it stopped working. How are these messages authenticated? So, I mean, you're going to have to testify about the original, where the original message was and what steps you took to preserve it and why you don't have the original. That's that's how it's going to be authenticated. Catch Kitty says, no, I meant two phones where employees to separate our business, work communications and personal. I'm very firmly against mixing these, although sometimes my employer encourages us to mix. Um, got it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that you should not mix them. I, I'm i with you on that. Oh, uh, Dominic, like the... Uh, NBA player Dominic Wilkins. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Want to get it right. Uh, pseudonym says, yes, I accepted the offer and started this week. That's incredible, Pseudonym. I'm really excited for you. If you ever want to share your experience as a young employment attorney on this channel, please consider the invitation out there. We would be thrilled. Um, obviously, if you want to keep your name off that, that's perfectly fine. Not everybody wants um, this notoriety, and I, I understand that. Uh, Noriega, one of the last ones says, how good are EOC investigators at seeing BS in employers' position statements? Depends on the investigator. Because a whole lot of holes in their position statement, just wondering if the EOC investigators are savvy enough. Listen, man, if they read it, I'm excited for you, which is the most depressing thing I could possibly say. 
but but I, I've definitely caught a lot of investigators not having read the position statement, um, and at best skimming the complaint, the charge of discrimination. That certainly happens. Silver lining soap says, I wish there was an attorney for small business owners. There's many. I run into many issues as employed people do, but it's all on me. Harassment and things like that are my problem. I can't complain to a boss, no HR. So there, there is actually small business attorneys. I don't know if they're in your area, but I happen to know many small business attorneys. Um, and often if you have like an accountant for your, for your small business, often the accountant will actually have recommendations of small business attorneys. SEK4110, thank you for all you do for us. My pleasure. Happy to help. I hope it's useful. Uh, study mode, I don't answer questions about workers' comp. I don't I don't practice workers' comp. I don't know about damages in workers' comp. I'm not going to answer a question about workers' comp. I apologize. That's not me being rude. I just don't feel qualified. Um, there are many workers' comp attorneys, and if you need, I will drag a workers' comp attorney bodily onto this channel and make them answer your questions. But I've, I'm already thinking of a few, frankly. Um, but I'm just not qualified. Uh, they evaluated you as a police officer. So mall cop who hurt his arm and was fired from a security guard job. I'm not calling him mall cop. That's his username, which is very funny. Um, says they evaluated him as a police officer when they said that he could not do his security guard job. Um, that sounds sketchy as all hell to me because you're not a police officer. I mean, you're not making arrests, right? Like, are you, mall cop, are you an armed? Like, do you, do you carry a weapon in your security guard job? Like, I don't really understand um, what they're trying to play at here. Ketcha, you deleted your message. I did not get to see it. Small Brown Dog, the HR director, CEO, whoa, CEO and two others in leadership who retaliated against me for protected activity have been fired or resigned since filing my lawsuit. Is this common? How does it affect? Um, I mean, listen, if they're firing the bad actors, that's a good thing and it's going to look good for them and it might might potentially reduce some of their risk and some of their, their damages in this action. Uh, it doesn't make the case invalid, doesn't make the case without merit and it doesn't make the case um worth nothing but small brown dog it, if they're doing the right thing it will lower your damages and and introduce some risk with the finder effect nyc damages uh, probably next friday will be the live stream i think uh although i will have to probably skew a little bit earlier because i think i have to pick someone up from the airport next friday so not that you need to know that, but, um, yeah, probably next Friday, maybe same time. Um, I think somebody in long Island asked me to do live streams after 6 PM. So I've been trying to do five to seven so they can, um, get, but I actually don't see them on live stream. So maybe, maybe they don't need it anymore. Uh, Zebuloni says, what is the likelihood of court order mediation working out? Um, fairly good. Like I would say like a third of cases will settle at a court order mediation. Like it, it happens. Um, but, but I mean, keep in mind that like the settlement rate in our field is very, very high in overall, like again, for our firm, like I, I less than 2% of our cases ever go to trial. So you know, the settlement rate's really high. Will it settle at the mediation? No, but the mediations can still forward later settlement discussions uh, and you can find out stuff at the mediation as well. So even if it doesn't settle at that mediation that ordered by the court, that mediation still has value in my opinion. Uh, Mall cop, just carry pepper spray. I really think they're they're off base firing you from that job. I think you have a claim. And that's just my opinion. You know, I don't know the case law where you are, but I would think that's a claim. Uh, study mode says, thanks Vince. I get that the civil and worker comp cases are different, but it is intersectional. That is difficult for me to get my head around. Thank you. Of course, I wasn't giving you a hard time. I just, if I don't feel, I, I'm not going to give answers that I don't feel comfortable with because people might rely on those answers. And, and if I'm wrong, then I'm harming them. So I wasn't, wasn't trying to sass you. It's just, I don't do workers comp and, um, 
probably not qualified to answer a workers' comp question. All right, it is 6.30. We've been going for an hour and a half. We have 30 minutes left, and then we are done. Done. And I am getting low on scotch. Well, that was a bad decision. Um, Dantana Slim says, I did billing insurance for six years without a title. After I asked for an accommodation, the director changed my schedule and placed me answering phones. Is this an emotion? If it hurts the conditions of your job, then yeah. If you earn less, if you have less chance for promotion, I mean, if it qualifies as a negative workplace consequence, and we have videos as to what is and is not a negative workplace consequence, then yes, I would say it's a demotion and a negative workplace consequence and potentially an element in a case um, if it was motivated again um, by you asking for an accommodation. Silver lining soap, is there a cap in what you can get if wrongfully terminated? I won my settlement. The attorney and I could have gotten more. I told them that it was a multi-million dollar company. Why not ask for more? So silver lining soap, I have no idea what your case was. Wrongful termination is not in and of itself usually a claim, but I assume you mean some kind of discrimination claim. Um, we have a damage calculation playlist that may be useful to you to determine if you settled your case for less than you should have, or if you were more in line with something that made sense if you're adjusting for risk at, at settlement. Uh, and I, I have no idea. Um, obviously, I'm not I'm not telling you what your case is worth because I don't know. NYC damages. Why does the EOC sometimes publish the amounts of settlements on their websites with names of companies, etc.? NYC damages, those are the settlements that are specifically arranged by the EEOC. Those are generally cases the EEOC um, took to enforcement, and they are trying to publicize how great they're doing as an agency and shame the company uh, for doing bad things and getting, getting brought to justice. Uh, study mode, I only know how to do one thing. So study mode says, I like that you role model sticking to your own area of expertise. I'm just not bright enough to talk about anybody else's area of expertise. Uh, gotcha Kitty says, I think Silver Linings has the same challenge we at small businesses. that We don't have HR and attorneys to specialize in employment. Absolutely. But those you have those things outsourced. Like if you need to, you can get a small business attorney who can involve an employment attorney or there's outsourced HR. Like these things exist. Um, yeah. Maria Hall, if you call the EOC and they say you have a case, should you hire a lawyer? If you experience workplace discrimination, workplace sexual harassment, and you want to bring a claim, I feel strongly that you should have a lawyer. Um, I think you will reduce risk and add value to your case. If you have a lawyer, the lawyer will charge you something. Obviously, usually mostly that charge will be mostly a percentage of whatever they win for you. Um, and you have to ask yourself if you think you're going to do sufficiently better that it makes sense to give up a percentage of your case. But in my opinion, yes, the answer is yes. You should you should have an attorney. Uh, study mode says there is Vince the role model and there's Vince the role player. I love when you use humor to imitate the clients and opposing counsel. It is helpful. Okay, so wait, I'm not going to do that right now, but I do have a story, quick story, because I need a break. Um, I was at our New York City office today and not today, this week. I was at our New York City office this week and we share the floor of this office building in Manhattan with, with some other, other law firms. And I was in my office, I was on the phone talking to a potential client, I believe. Um, so, you know, somebody had gone through our entire intake process and had, it was their, their telephone consultation. And I had my office door unlocked and this woman was speaking loudly in the hallway and I, whatever, I ignored it. And then all of a sudden she opens the door and like busts into my office, like throws the door open and walks in my office, kind of like shout talking into her phone, like saying like, I'm just going to step into an office. So it's quieter. And I'm like on the phone in a confidential communication with a potential client who, who I owe a duty of loyalty to, like I owe confidentiality to. So like I half stand up from my desk. I'm like, hey, hey, you got to get out of here. This isn't, I don't know who you are, but you got to knock first and like, you can't be in here. This woman looks me dead in the eye, like, <clears throat> and goes, hey, don't push me. 
I was still at my desk. We we were like fi- 15 feet apart. And I just stared. I was like, the potential client heard that because we were on speakerphone. She's like, don't push me. I'm like, I- I'm nowhere near you. I <laughs> And then she just walked out of my office and like slammed the door. Who are these people? Who, who are these people? The lawyers of New York, mentally ill. Me too. Me too. Not just her. All right. Um, ooh, I'm getting lots of hearts on here. Thank you, everybody. <coughs> Thank you for all the heart emojis. Uh, okay, Zebuloni. If a manager altered the content of an employer, if an employee's work folder many weeks after firing the employee, and the person has the evidence of the alteration, could this help the person at the mediation? Yes, especially if the alterations were in preparation or appear to be in preparation for litigation. Yeah, that's going to be really valuable for you. No question. Uh, Karina Marie says, I was sexually harassed, retaliated against, and faced a hostile workplace in one state. The EOC sent the inquiry to the state that I live in. For reference, I am a truck driver. And the attorneys I've contacted keep passing me back and forth between states. Um, I'm really sorry, first off, that you experienced that. If you can't find a good attorney in either one of the states that you were driving in, talk to one of the national firms. Case, certainly, from what you're saying, sounds good. And I would imagine all the national firms would make you offers of representation. Although they will, generally speaking, be substantially more expensive than local counsel. Uh, Catch a Kitty says, yes, I always recommend owners of a small business get HR consultants, etc. Sometimes they get it. Sometimes they don't. They don't know what they don't know. That is a great statement. Um, that's a great statement. Sebuloni, I appreciate the heart emoji being lifted by little blue hands. I'm going to assume those are Smurf hands. Smurf hands lifting the heart. Oh, we are caught up on questions. NYC Damages says, is changing someone's schedule worse hours after taking FMLA always wrong and retaliation? I would say yes. I mean, listen, not always. There's a circumstance where like that could make sense for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I would say that that would generally be retaliatory. Steady Mode says, LOL, I like the client who wouldn't shut up about his blood pressure, even though you explained that he should shut up about it. These stories drive them home and make us all better clients. So, like, that is kind of the point of the stories. Um, and there's there's definitely, like, attorneys who will come to me and, and some some folks who watch the channel who are like, I don't like it when you make fun of clients. I think it's really gross. Like, you're, like, mocking people who've been through a lot. And that's true. I am. But first off, those stories, I ship them of names, places, all identifying characteristics. I change anything that could lead back to an actual human being because I'm not going to appreciate my clients. But also beyond that, um, like people need to hear these stories because these are recurring things. Like not listening to your attorney or like the the client who's like, um, I guess that on my case for. Oh, I think you should consider a demand of about 500000 You're selling me out. Okay, what makes you think that? How much do they pay you? Okay, slow down. Like, what? Wh- why did you ask me if you were just going to start screaming at me? Like, what? What are we doing here? Like, th- these things happen, and they happen multiple times a year for like every employment attorney. And I'm not like making fun of the paranoia. I, I understand the paranoia. So many people have been arrayed against you for so long, and you've been through so much that paranoia is a rational reaction. It has become the norm for many people to do horrible things to you. And I'm not saying every single attorney is great. They're not. Most of my channel is dedicated to be like, well, that attorney sounds like a piece of shit. But generally speaking, even really bad attorneys want good results for you because that's how they get paid. So like the the trope of the client is like, you took a bribe. Probably not, statistically speaking. Has it happened? Sure. And, and I was even able to dredge up like a history. Like I, I knew I knew of a firm that did it, right? Like they took a bribe, a fee-fixing scandal, right? But I knew of like two ever. That doesn't mean that's all there is. 
But that's true that cropped up in the entirety of my practice, the entirety of the rumor mill, the entirety of all the time I've spent in this field. And generally speaking, if there's shit to rake, people are raking it my way. They want me to know because they think I'm going to enjoy it, right? Like I, I definitely like listen to the rumor mill. So like fee fixing, bribing attorneys, stuff like that doesn't really happen that much. So the importance of telling that story is to kind of be like, hey, this is how you sound because the attorney probably isn't on the take. The, the attorney probably isn't getting bribed to sell you out. They might be trying to push you to a smaller settlement because they don't work that hard. That's a different conversation. But that's not what you're saying. You're saying they're on, they're taking bribes, right? And that's statistically speaking, again, which is probably not true. Oh, we got some questions built up again. Well, I told my little diatribe. Uh, Katja Kitty says, so for remote workers, should it be the law of the state that the employee's residence and work apply? Or can the employer force you to comply with their home state in your offer letter? Gotcha. I don't fully understand what you mean. Are you saying choice of law? Are you saying where you work? What, what are you asking? Silver lining soap. What are the hardest wrongful termination cases to prove? Failure to hire cases. I mean, I guess that's not technically a wrongful termination case. Um, but you know, also like elevator cases, um, which is like two people in an elevator, no witnesses, no recordings, just one witness against another witness. Those can be the hardest to prove because you have no evidence besides you're you're basically saying, like, listen, I need to make my client more credible to the finder of fact than their client. And that's all you got. That's the whole game. And it's cool because it's like down to your client's ability to communicate and be believed and your ability to like build your client's credibility up. So like it's simplified and there's a lot of art, like terms of art and in, in, art in terms of like ability in our industry that goes into that case. So those cases are super sexy for attorneys. Like the, he said, she said is actually like a, let me, let me like roll my sleeves up and show you what I got kind of situation. Right. But, um, they are, they are, you know, they're higher risk. It's hard to prove because you don't have any evidence besides, you know, he said, she said. Uh, Dantana Slim says a demand letter was sent two months ago and the defendant answered, but we haven't got anything now. So I have now I have 90 days to sue. My attorney is not asking for money yet, just the accommodation. I mean, listen, if you got an attorney and the attorney's willing to take the federal litigation, I would do so. I might add a monetary demand because federal litigation is, is a big undertaking and you want that attorney to get paid without a doubt. Um, steady mode says the mocking is totally helpful and, uh, adds humor when your viewers need to laugh. I hope so. Um, Dintana slim. I usually, it sounds like you should expect litigation. If they're, if they're refusing to speak with you and you're on your way to litigation, it sounds like that's the next step. Zebuloni says, how could a plaintiff emotionally prepare himself for mediation? Um, to whatever extent you can. Really anchor yourself with your support structure, whoever those people are for you. Um, do whatever you can to digest what was done to you. If you can move beyond it, move beyond it. And that's going to help you with the very gross process of putting a dollar figure to what was done to you. Um, and it is gross. It is gross. Also, remember to treat your well-being as a slowly renewing a resource. So like leading up to the mediation, don't do a whole bunch of things that are going to erode your well-being and your ability to deal with the trauma from this uh, situation, because you can build up some additional emotional stamina, for lack of a better term, leading into that mediation is very valuable. What, uh, what are some unexpected events that can emotionally shake a plaintiff during mediation? People show up a lot that you don't want to show up. Like sometimes bad actors are brought in to rattle plaintiffs. Um, I've had cases where defense counsel showed up with, you know, receipts for affairs that were unrelated. And my client just had an allegedly had an affair. And they're like, we know you had the affair. And we know you love your kids. And your husband, you know, you love your husband, but, uh, this fair is coming out. If, uh, you know, you don't 
go ahead and sign that settlement agreement and stuff like that happens. Like, and, and you know, you can go as hard as you want as an attorney in that situation, but sometimes the client wants to protect what they, what they got, you know, <clears throat> a Watkins says, if they go to mediation, does that mean they are going to offer money? Generally? Yeah. 99 times out of a hundred. If you're going to mediation, they're going to offer you money. Small brown dog. Will employer's defense attorney represent prep and coach third party fact witnesses that formerly worked for the employer? Yes. Zebuloni, is it common for mid level managers to withhold certain information from the administrator and company lawyer? Yeah, they lie a lot to protect themselves. It's actually fairly common. Uh, mid level managers are unpredictable at best. Like it's, it's, Nobody knows where a mid-level manager is going to land. They are wild cards. Uh, Catch a Kitty says, I was asking which state law typically applies if the employer is pretty much virtual, but the entity is a different state than the employer's live lives in and works from. So Catch a, um, there might be a choice of law in the employment agreement. However, um, generally speaking, if you're living in one place, and working in another, there's some ability to forum shop, venue shop, shop the laws of the different states. If you're not limited by some agreement you've entered into to uh, agree upon what law controls the situation. And also, even those agreements are not infallible. Sometimes they're not enforceable. Dintana, uh, Dintana Slim says, I love these live chats. Thank you so much, Vince. You're the best. My pleasure. I hope I hope I helped in some way. Um, so quick point of order, we have 13 minutes left. 13 minutes left, and then we are done. There is a hard out at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I am not staying past 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, NYC Damage just says, to add to Zemulian's question, do you need to worry about being tricked into, tricked? oh, not tricked into mediation, but tricked during mediation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, listen, they're going to open more often than not with, settlement figure under fifteen thousand dollars often one thousand or twenty five hundred and if they can get you beat up into taking that they will and listen there's definitely cases that should settle for those amounts don't get me wrong like there's cases where you get into the case you're like we do not have the evidence that we thought we had or or they have evidence of regrettable things that are bad for our case right and listen that might make sense to settle for I mean, hopefully not 2,500, but like 15, 10, whatever it is, right? In those cases, that makes sense. But um, they're going to tell you it makes sense, even if it doesn't. They're absolutely there to try to get you to take the littlest amount of money they possibly can. The least amount of money they possibly can. Uh, silver lining soap, you get more cases from older people, aka people born before 1990. I had a bad thing happen a job as a 20 something I brushed off. I would definitely address now at 40 something uh, silver lining soap. We do in our firm without a doubt, but our firm suffers from the high class problem of having really high end clients. Um, a lot of people who earn a lot of money will hire us because we tend to be a more expensive option and they'll seek us out um through other attorneys or their accounts or whatever through through professional networks whatever it is so those people those high earners tend to be born before 1990 right like um as the oldest millennial possible born in 1982 i uh you know i um generally generally higher truly high earners are going to be 40 and up so listen we still try to help people who are not high earners don't get me wrong um, but the bulk of our clientele, the people who like seek us out and don't stop until we're representing them, those people tend to be, um, quite affluent and over 40. So I can't speak to other firms. Clinton Rain says, <coughs> What are the pros and cons for a plaintiff when a former employer has had a complete management change, including all individuals involved and not involved top management? 
So the great thing for you is potentially no witnesses. They may not be able to get anyone to come in and testify against your version of events. The bad thing for you is they might argue, oh, we got rid of all the bad people. Uh, Clint says they're bad, so we got rid of them. Is that why they did it? Maybe, maybe not. That's the counterpoint to them not having any witnesses. Uh, Zebuloni says, what are some strategies you use at the mediation if your goal is to reinstate the plaintiff? So often I will anchor. So I'll say, listen, our primary goal, our primary goal is reinstatement. That's what my client wants. Now, if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to do that, I think damages here are going to be like 3.5 mil. And listen, you can, you can shout at me all you want, Stephen. You can get as mad as you want, defense counsel. But I think the damage is 3.5 mil. And I think if we run this for federal lit, you're going to spend easily close to 300K defending it. And the fact of the matter is, all your employer, all your client has to do is the right thing, right? All you got to do is bring my guy back. My guy was very successful. He made your client a lot of money. Doesn't your client like money? Doesn't your client want to do the right thing? Doesn't your client want to avoid spending 300 grand? to fight me off as I try to rip 3.5 million out of them. If that's not something your client's interested in, I guess they, they shouldn't reinstate my client, but it just seems like if your client's rationally self-interested, you would assume they want to at least investigate where they can bring my client back. I mean, why would you not? Why would you not? We could be done today. What are you, what are you, Stephen, what are you 1500 an hour? I mean, you're not even that good. Who wants to pay 1500 an hour for a piece of shit? Like I would imagine this reinstatement, it's looking like a hell of a deal right now, Stephen. Obviously, I'm not going to say this, Stephen, but you get what I'm saying. Like, it, 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 you need to anchor it with um, some some leverage, some incentive to get the reinstatement because employers do not want to reinstate. Uh, NYC damages. I meant trick during mediation on lack of legal knowledge, like a pro se would possibly be tricked in court. Yes, NYC damages. Um, defense counsel will absolutely trick pro se litigants at mediation. And I'll go a step further. Defense counsel will absolutely trick inexperienced employment attorneys, or like you'll you'll see PI attorneys or matrimonial attorneys uh, take employment cases sometimes. And there's zero chill in terms of defense counsel. Like they'll be like, "Oh yeah, you can't. There's no way. There's a soft cap of 100k in emotionals." You'll never beat the soft cap. My friend, I have, we have never, in all the firms I've ever worked for, to my knowledge, all the cases I've ever seen that won at trial, never failed to exceed 100,000 emotionals. Never once. But defense counsel will go around, be like, buddy, buddy, nobody beats the soft cap. Nobody gets over 100K. You're not going to get, you, you're asking me for 200K in emotionals, but nobody ever gets that. I've never once in my life Never once in my life seen someone end up under 100K. And defense counsel be like, no, that never happens. So often, I'll <laughs> you just bring the verdict sheets. It'll just be like, bop, 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 bop. Oh, I guess it does happen. Like, it, but they'll, they'll 100% just say, it never happens. It never happens. Like, okay, get the fuck out of here. Pardon my language. Um, ooh, what do we got? What do we got? Small Brown Dog says, to mitigate damages after being wrongfully terminated, are you required to make a job out of state that require you to move? Generally, no. I mean, it, it also depends on the job. Like, if you're like, I run solar farms. I'm a solar farm administrator. That's what I do. And there's like six solar farms in the country. Then, yeah, maybe you have to like take a job out of state. But if there are jobs for what you do in the state, then you don't have to like throw away your life. Um, to find comparable employment, to mitigate. A. Watkins, after working for 10 months, after requesting reasonable accommodation, I resigned and filed an EOC complaint. Employers said they were going to accommodate me two months after I quit. Okay, did they bring you back? If they brought you back, then your damages are too much of economic plus emotional. Uh, bop, bop, bop. The most high's daughter, resident nurse. Are there any loopholes around the EOC process? The company I hired to help me through the process dropped the ball. Uh, when you say drop the ball, do you mean they blew the statute of limitations? What do you mean? How did they drop the ball? Shell in the city says, I just re rejected a buyout today after being fired for making a complaint against my boss. 
This is also after FMLA leave. I don't know if I'm going to sue them. I, I literally something for the court itself, LOL. Um, I assume you're saying you work for the court. So listen, don't be worried about suing the court. If you work for a state court, sue in federal court. If you work for a federal court, sue in the state court. I mean, if, to the extent you can. Um, I mean, that sounds like a good claim. I would consider pursuing that. Uh, Stace Erickson says, can you use negative comments on Glassdoor against the company? Should I be collecting them? If you, I mean, anonymous comments are not going to be that valuable. But if you have people who are willing to act as witnesses that you find on Glassdoor, that's amazing. Uh, Zibuloni, wouldn't the employer retaliate against the plaintiff once reinstated? Definitely happens. Not always. And there are protections against retaliation and retaliation claims are very valuable. So many employers don't. What are some potential interventions to protect the vulnerable plaintiff following reinstatement? Just keep the attorney, keep your attorney's card in your wallet is basically the thing. So the employer is going to be trained and know not to retaliate because that's the first thing the defense counsel is going to uh, take care of. Uh, Steady Moses, I know you want to wrap up. Glad to see your cough is better. Love the outfit. Thank you. Uh, thank you and good night and good night to you and have a lovely weekend. Sebuloni, your cat is missing in action. We miss her. Me too. Um, A. Watkins, no, they never brought me back and don't want to mediate. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, if you get to keep your job, oh, Dantana Slim, if you get to keep your job, can you secure not getting fired in the future at mediation? Generally not. Uh, generally not. Generally, if you are being reinstated, employers will not enter into an agreement that they will not fire you. Um, Shell in the city, I agree that you were being retaliated against. It certainly sounds that way. And I thank you for saying you love the channel. Uh, Zy later. Hello says, would writing a blog about sexual harassment and racial discrimination at my work discourage an attorney from taking my case? Yes. Yeah, potentially. If you put your name on it, if it, if it's known to be your blog and it's very clear, like who the blog is talking about and who's writing it. And what employer, it would um, be a huge amount of uncontrolled communication that the attorney would have to deal with, all of which could add risk and reduce value on the case. So it would be a point um, not in your favor, I would say, which is not to dissuade you. I'm just saying maybe you want to keep it anonymous. Uh, Silver Lining Soap says, thank you so much. This was awesome. I'm so happy I found this live. Have a great weekend. You too. Have a great weekend. Thank you for saying kind things. All right, we have two minutes, two minutes left, two minutes, and then we are done. Possibly the last question here, the Most High's daughter, resident nurse, says, after the EOC found merit in my case, the contractor felt that all the evidence hadn't been addressed, so he resubmitted the case. He told me to hold off finding a lawyer, and I lost my 90-day right to sue. He didn't tell me the clock didn't stop ticking. That's horrific. I'm really sorry. So you need to immediately check your state and local statute of limitations. You may have lost your federal claims. I'm not going to lie to you. You may have lost them. But all is not lost if you still are within the statute of limitations on the local or state level. Often local and state laws have longer statute of limitations than the EUC does. So I would immediately, immediately check that out. But keep in mind that those statute of limitations are not... Um, you know, not unlimited. So get on those immediately. Um, Zebuloni, unfortunately, the cat uh, experienced liver failure. My cat, uh, my cat did pass away. She experienced liver failure. Um, she was an old kitty. Um, and she passed um, peacefully, surrounded by people who loved her, um, and the attention of a vet. Um, Alfalfa says, Vince, do you need to get employment law experience while in law school if you want to practice in this field? No. What's your opinion on clinics, internships? Clinics and internships are amazing. Um, they are very, very important, and they help attorneys to become valuable when they get out of um, law school. But um, there's no experience. There's no, there's no replacement for working at an employment law firm. 
Uh, Zebuloni and Most High's daughter. I appreciate the kind words. I don't. I don't want to talk about the cat. Uh, it's, it's it bums me out. Obviously, um, she was a great cat. I loved her for many many years, and she was very old. And it is what it is. Uh, Nicodemus Hartsock says, "Hey, Vince, I love your show. Thank you. I had a situation where I was hurt while doing an onboarding process for a home health aid position. I hit my head and fell on the floor after doing a blood draw for a drug." Uh, that sounds like a potential workers' compensation claim. That is certainly worth speaking to a workers' compensation attorney about. A Watkins, yes. The EOC will tell you to some extent if the time is run out on your claim. However, um, they will probably still issue a right to sue letter because they don't actually care. So there's that. Um, NYC damages law school is generally three years in most law schools. Although uh, you can do night school and do it for four years in some programs, or there are some two-year law school programs. Generally speaking, um, studying employment law is valuable and good if you want to become an employment attorney, but not required. Uh, Nicodemus, I would absolutely go to an uh, workers' compensation attorney right away and potentially a doctor as well. Um, yes. Thank you. NYC damages. She was very popular on the channel and, uh, she was a great kitty. Anyways, everyone, I hope you're having a lovely Friday evening. It is 7 1 PM Eastern time. I am hungry. I'm going to go live my life and, uh, I hope that you will as well. Um, take care everyone. And, um, I wish you the best.